Father, we thank you that you that you love us, that you've rescued us, that you have redeemed us from our sin, from ourselves, from, from your wrath, and that through Christ you have uh, called us to, to know you, and someday in full, someday without distance between us, without this veil that separates us now, but, but we'll see you in full because we'll be like you. Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for your word. We thank you that you have not left us alone, that you have given us your spirit and given us your word. Father, let us be a, a church that takes truth seriously, that takes your word seriously, and that seeks to live in ways that are honoring and pleasing to you. Father, give us understanding and insight and humility as we look to your word now and we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and open up with me to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We started last week in this second part of 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul addressing the last of the issues that the church in Corinth had written to him about. They had written him a letter asking him questions. Uh, this was one. This issue of the Lord's table. And we saw that they were abusing the Lord's table. That they had, uh, if we look at verse 18, he says, For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part. Verse 20, For when you come together, it is not the Lord's supper that you eat. For in eating, one goes ahead with his own meal, one goes hungry, another gets drunk. They were not coming together in unity to celebrate what Christ had done. What? Verse 22. Do you not have houses? Or I'm sorry, verse 21. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat or drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? They weren't caring for each other. It was supposed to be a communal meal where everybody came together and there was no uh, D division between those who had much and those who had little. It was all to be shared and they were simply ruining it. And so last week we looked at how unity honors the Lord's Supper. Today we're going to look at how truth honors the Lord's Supper. And, and really... Um, well, it's been, it's been a long attack, but I, I got this, uh, I, was, I was sent this, a couple of different articles recently. Here's one called, Survey Finds Most American Christians Are Actually Heretics. Now, I thought when I got this, it was going to be some kind of spoof. Like, if you ever get anything that comes from the Babylon Bee, it's a spoof, okay? It's, the whole website is designed to be churchy kind of spoof stuff. But unfortunately, what I found was not a spoof. Evangelical writer Eric Metaxas, who if you have not read his book Bonhoeffer, read it. Evangelical writer Eric Metaxas remarked on Breakpoint last week that if Americans took a theology exam, their only hope of passing would be if God graded on a curve. He's right in knowing both the content of the Bible and the doctrinal foundations of Christianity. We Americans aren't just at the bottom of our class. We are, as Ross Duthat argues in his book, Bad Religion, a nation of heretics. A survey of 3,000 people conducted by Lifeway Research and commissioned by Ligonier Ministries found that Americans still overwhelmingly identify as Christians, Americans that although, I'm sorry, uh, that although Americans still overwhelmingly identify as Christians, startling percentages of the nation embrace ancient errors condemned by all major Christian traditions. These are not minor points of doctrine, but core ideas that define Christian Christianity itself. The really sad part, even when we're denying the divinity of Christ, we can't keep our story straight. Americans talking about theology sound about as competent as country singers rapping. He goes on, and I've highlighted some, some points that I would just like to read you. Seven out of ten respondents in LifeWay's survey affirmed the doctrine of the Trinity, that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are three persons, but one God. That's pretty good. And six in ten agreed that Jesus is both human and divine. Also pretty good. But it kind of stops there. The responses to other questions were no less heterodox or headache-inducing. 70% of 
participants who ranged across socioeconomic and racial backgrounds agreed there's only one true God. Yet 64% also thought that God accepts the worship of all religions, including those that believe in many gods. Two-thirds admitted that everyone sins a little bit, but still insisted that most people are good by nature, which, contra which directly contradicts Scripture. A full 60% agreed that everyone eventually goes to heaven, but half of those surveyed also checked the box that said only those who believe in Jesus will be saved. Well, saved from what then? Evangelicals didn't even study for this test. It's one thing for Americans in general to lack basic theological knowledge. After all, many of the 75% of this country who call themselves Christians don't take their faith that seriously. And the rest are either members of other religions or have no, uh, or have no religion. Only participants who called the Bible their highest authority said personal evangelism is important and indicated that trusting in Jesus' death on the cross is the only way of salvation were labeled as evangelical. So only people who said the Bible is the highest authority, we need to evangelize, and that Jesus' death on the cross is the only way of salvation, only those people who affirmed those three things were considered evangelical. 586 of the survey takers fit in to that category but everyone expected to them to perform better than most americans no one expected them to perform worse seven in ten evangelicals more than the population at large said that jesus was the first being god created 56 percent agreed that the holy spirit is a divine force but not a personal being they also saw a huge increase in evangelicals, 28% up from 9%, who indicated that the first person or that the third person of the Trinity is not equal with God the Father or Jesus. But could it also have something to do with the fact that two out of five evangelicals say worshiping alone or with family is a valid replacement for regularly attending church? It goes on from there and just continues to get worse and worse and worse. In a note of sarcasm, here's how the author ends his article. He said, the results of this survey ought to embarrass all of us, but they should also serve as a kick in the pants to refamiliarize ourselves with our own religion, or at least our own history. There's no excuse to be a nation of heretics, but even that is preferable to being a nation of ignoramuses. I think the church faces two great problems today. One is heartless intellectualism that says it doesn't matter what I feel as long as I've got my head wrapped around doctrine right, as long as I believe the right things, as long as I can answer the tough questions, it doesn't matter how I live, it doesn't matter how I feel, it doesn't matter what I do, I've got it all worked out up here. The second and I think equally great problem is mindless compassion. It doesn't matter what I believe, I'm not a theologian after all. We'll leave that to the pastors and the experts. I, I know that Jesus loves me. I know that he died on the cross. Uh, but, but really what matters is that we live like Christ, that we go out and we care for people, that we meet needs, that we show compassion, that we accept everybody. Well, I think both are are real problems. I'm going to pick on the second one first. Satan's first attack on Adam and Eve that we read about today, his first attack was an attack on truth. He came to the garden and he said, did God actually say? Did God really say it's not good to eat of the fruit? Did God really say that? Did God really forbid that? Did God really condemn that? Can you really believe that what God said is really true? It was an attack on truth. Because as we'll see later, the, the, the attack on truth results in the, the falling apart of everything else. And I think we've come to a church culture today that is trying to do the same. It's no longer a direct attack from Satan on God's people. It's happening in the church. Well, well Scripture doesn't really say that blank is sin. 
Scripture doesn't really say that this isn't true. If we really understand culture, if we really understand context, then we'll understand that all of these difficult stuff that we don't like to talk about so much, just it, it doesn't really have anything to do with, with me. Did God actually say that was wrong? I sat down and I made a list of the things that I think, not the world, that churches today are saying is acceptable. Lust. Lust isn't a problem as long as you're not out having an affair. Premarital sex. The church has given up grounds on that. It's okay. Or it's okay to do almost everything before you're married. Greed. It's okay to be greedy. It's okay to have a mentality of get as much as you can and hoard it all to yourself. Gluttony. Pride. Nationalism. Wait a minute. I'm a good, I'm a, I'm a good American. Well... There's nothing wrong with being an American as long as you're a Christian first. But I think what the election season this year is showing us is that uh, many Americans put more faith in their political system or, or their um, nationality than they do in their God. Divorce, not a problem. Gender roles, they're up for grabs. Homosexuality, God didn't really mean that was wrong. Weak fathers, not a big deal. Addiction, that's okay. Anger, well, at least I didn't go out and kill somebody. Gossip, we'll hide it as a prayer request. Well, let's pray for so-and-so who's going through this. And God sits up in heaven and says, that's just disgusting and sin. Slander, it's okay to talk badly about people. What about not just sins, though? In the church today, the idea that truth exists is under attack. Guys like Brian McLaren writing books called Gen uh, Generous Orthodoxy are talking about how uh, maybe what we should do is we should go out and tell people about Jesus and leave them where they're at. It's okay if they're a, a Muslim. It's okay if they're a Jew. It's okay if they're a, a Hindu. It's okay if they're whatever. As long as they follow Jesus, we're giving up ground on preaching. We're not going to have preachers anymore, but we're going to have nice guys who offer uh, gentle suggestions in an effort to try and not step on anybody's toes and not say that anything isn't true i'm not kidding there there are churches who are removing the word preacher or or pastor from their leadership and inserting the word guide because after all truth doesn't exist the bible is authoritative is under attack preaching is valuable is under attack never mind that the bible says that god has ordained the foolishness of preaching to save people Jesus is the only way to God. That's under attack. Jesus was fully God. That's under attack. Jesus is fully man. All of these are under attack. Or how about, the, how about these? How about these? Doctrine divides. Doctrine divides. Truth is troubling. And so we're not going to, to have anything to do with it. Let's set aside our creeds, beliefs, and doctrines so that we can just go out and focus on showing the love of Christ. It's mindless compassion that all that matters is not what we think, but how we live. Uh, I read this in a book called The Truth War. Many people these days evidently find that suggestion appealing. On the surface, it may sound generous, kind-hearted, modest, and altruistic. But the view itself is a serious violation of the way of Jesus, who taught that salvation hinges on hearing and believing his word, John 5, 24. He said, the words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life, John 6, 63. To those who doubted his truth claims, he said, if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins, John 8, 24. And here is the... the I mean, if this doesn't seal the argument, I don't know what does. He never left any room for someone to imagine that the propositional content of his teaching is optional as long as we mimic his behavior. I'm going to read that again. He never left any room for someone to imagine that the propositional content of his teaching is optional as long as we mimic his behavior. Because the reality is this, that salvation is a matter of our relationship to truth. Salvation is a matter of our relationship to truth. If you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and confess with your mouth that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Look at John... Uh, 
Put a finger in 1 Corinthians 11 here and turn with me over to John chapter 8. Starting in verse 31. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. They answered him, we are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Verse 34, Jesus answered them, truly I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. I speak of what I have seen with my father and you do what you have heard from your father. In other words, your relationship to Jesus as truth is what determines whether we are slaves to sin or freed men in Christ. Truth is absolutely vital to the Christian life and it cannot simply be relegated to the big areas we can't say I've got the big things in place, the little things don't matter. Satan never attacks the big things. He never comes to, he didn't go to the garden and say, God doesn't exist. What's stopping you? They walked with God, they talked with God, they knew God. He didn't attack the big areas. He attacked the small ones by poking holes in truth. God did not surely say Satan attacks the finer points of our doctrine. He attacks the finer points of theology. And don't let the word theology scare you off. I know what many mean when they say, well, I'm not a theologian. But all theology means is knowing God. So to say that you don't care about theology is to say that you are unconcerned with knowing who God is. God has chosen to reveal himself in his word, in a book. If I told you that I declassified every single state secret from the federal government, how many in here, don't raise your hand, would want to read it? But when God Almighty says that he has revealed the secrets of eternity, of his character, of his nature, of his plan, of who he is and what he demands from us, we say, I'll let somebody else take care of that. Would you, uh, if I were a boat builder and I took that philosophy, would you buy my boat? Hey, all the big pieces are there, but the little cracks, they don't matter. Don't worry about them. Don't be concerned. We got big stuff going on, and so this ship will float. I've got the frame. I've got the engine. I forgot to skin the hull, but I think we're good. I mean, that's really only a small part of, of, of a piece of a boat. Hop in. Who's going for a ride with me? Nobody, that ship's going to sink. And I think today is, I, I, I think the, the church culture today is evidence that this ship is sinking. I have long in my ministry and my life been reticent to say I think it's the end times. But honestly, as I look at the world around us and I look at the church in the world, it seems to me like we are spiraling out of control. And I'm not sure the world's fixable apart from the return of Christ apart from God's divine work. The finer points matter. The war against people is a war, or against God's people is a war on truth, and it always starts in the small places. This is why we as a church need to be singing things like, and can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood and not na, 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 na. Right? What does that mean? And what, how is that worship? Worship is responding, both intellectually and emotionally, to the truth of God. How can you worship to na, 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 na? It's mindless. You know what Paul called people who talk like that? Barbarians. You know where we get the word barbarian from? It's from a Greek word. And you know where it, it's onomatopoeia. Bar, 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 barbarian. Na, 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 knuckleheads. I don't know. <laughs> However, heartless intellectualism is no better by way of comparison. Heartless intellectualism is no better. And the reason why is that neither heartless intellectualism nor mindless compassion can save us. 
They both end in hell. James 2, verses 14 through 20. You don't have to turn there now. But James tells us faith without works is dead. There's a reason that James is talking about going out and feeding people. He says, don't look at somebody in need and say, be warmed and filled, but don't do anything about it. And then he says, faith without works, can that save you? Can that kind of faith save you? It's a rhetorical question designed to be given a hearty no answer because immediately he follows it up with, even the demons believe and shudder. Even the demons believe what is true about God. Even Satan knew what was true about God. The problem was, there was no heart. There was no, no affection for God, no affection for God's people, no, no, no heart that cared to know God, to love God, to delight in God. It was simply uh, an exercise in, in their head. And James says that, that faith that exists only in your head and not in your heart will result in death. And Jesus says the exact opposite in Matthew 7, 22. But some may well say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And I will say, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness, for I never knew you. They, they, ha they didn't have what was right in their head. They had their actions right. They cared for people. They were trying maybe even to earn their salvation, but they weren't thinking rightly about God. So having a faith that exists only in our head will send us directly to hell. And having a faith that's only in our heart, apart from our head, will send us directly to hell. Salvation involves both the head and the heart. It is knowing what is true about God and loving what is true about God. We have to have both in place. And the sad part about the church in Corinth is they had screwed both up. They were, they were in the wrong spot on both of them. Not only were they coming to the, cel to the Lord's Supper, to this celebration, what, which what should have been the truth of his death and resurrection, but they weren't thinking about it. They weren't considering what Christ had done. They weren't even talking about it. They were just coming early, getting there, bringing their food, eating, drinking, getting drunk, and abusing people who were poor. They didn't have anything in their mind or in their heart. And how does Paul correct both of those problems? With truth. This is interesting to me. I've said for a long time that, that if even sometimes when, when we don't feel rightly, we need to think rightly because our hearts follow our heads. When Paul wants to, and this is all over the New Testament, when Paul wants to correct or, or any of the biblical authors want to correct wrong thinking, they combat it with truth. But when they want to combat wrong living, they combat it with truth. Same battle, same front, same work. Look with me at uh, Romans 12, 1 and 2. Here. You can turn there if you'd like or I'll read it to you. Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world. I think we could clearly say that Paul probably has in mind here both thinking and doing. I can't imagine the Apostle Paul saying that it would be okay not to live like the world, but okay to think like the world. Nor can I, I see him say it would be okay not to think like the world, but to live like the world. He says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, no truth, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. It starts with truth. It results in how we live. Similarly, in John 17, 17, Jesus says in his high priestly prayer, sanctify them. That word sanctify is, is the process of becoming holy. It, it is a lifelong process from the time we come to faith in Jesus Christ and are justified from our sin until we go to glory and are fully sanctified, made like Christ Sanctification is that process. Jesus says this, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. When Paul wants to correct both wrong thinking and wrong, wrong living, he uses truth. 
Now let's look at the passage. Let's look at his correction here, starting in verse 23. He says, for. This word for is a connecting word. It connects what he's about to say with everything he said before. Verse 17, he says, but in the following instructions, I do not commend you. I do not commend you. And here's all of the things that you are doing wrong. And here now, for is, for I am going to tell you what you need to know so that you can live how you need to live. For I received, this, this word received, uh, paralabon in the, in the Greek is, uh, it's a rabbinic word. It has the sense of to, to receive teaching. It would be used like a, in a, from a rabbi to his students. And the students, in talking about the teaching of the rabbi, would say, I received this from my rabbi. And so, so Paul says, for I received... As a student from the Lord, what I also delivered, pardoka, another uh, rabbinic word here, that has the sense to, to formally input authoritative teaching. So here's what Paul's saying. I received something from Christ that I am now delivering to you. As he passed it on to me, I'm now passing it on to you. What's, what is he trying to tell us here with this? It's not option, optional. This isn't church tradition. This isn't negotiable. This isn't my opinion. This isn't what I am hoping to do. My rabbi informed me of this, and I, as your rabbi, am, am, am informing you. The interesting thing about the whole rabbinical system was rabbis would gather students and they would instruct them. And what motivated them in this instruction, not only in knowledge but in living, was that when, when the rabbi was dead and gone, the disciple would pick up where he left off. So Jesus called 12 disciples who then went out and made more disciples. And this is what he's saying. I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you. You're not living like you know. How many times as parents do we look at our children and say, you know better than that? Paul's telling them, you know better. I've already delivered this, delivered this to you. That the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, that's, that's an important word there, betrayed. He's giving us context. We're going to talk a little more later about what the context of the Lord's Supper is, but keep that in mind. That on the night that he was betrayed, the night that he underwent six trials, the night that he was sentenced to death, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, given thanks in the Greek is eucharisteo, it's where the, the term Eucharist comes from uh, in talking sometimes and reading about the Lord's Supper. When he had given thanks, and I think the church has traditionally called it the Eucharist because as Jesus gave thanks at the Last Supper, so we are to give thanks for the cross, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Notice that it does not say, or at least your text hopefully should not say, this is my body which is broken for you. There are some manuscripts that have broken in it. They're not very reliable and we don't trust them very often. And Isaiah goes to great length to explain to us in chapter 53 uh, that Jesus' body was never broken. And in fact, when he died on the cross, when they wanted to hurry along the process of the thieves, they broke their legs, but they found Jesus to be already dead and so his legs were not broken this is my body which is for you do this in remembrance of me this word remembrance is uh onomnason. now you've probably anybody heard of the term mnemonic device uh, a device you use to remember something in your mind, to put it in your mind. That's the Greek word here, anamnason, a mnemonic device. Uh, it, it literally means to put it in your mind. This is my body, which is for you. Put this in your mind about me. Don't forget, remember, know. Let me ask you something. Apart from truth, how can you remember? How can you remember that which you don't know? 
We, we need to not think in theology here in terms of bogging us down and, and weighing us down and, and difficulty and struggle and division. We ought to think this. In fact, Monday night, if we were, if for those men who were here, you remember that, G, that uh, John Piper said something that, I, that was really impacting me. He said, Thanksgiving should be growing every moment because there's more in the past for me to give thanks for. There's more grace of God for me to be grateful for. That's what theology does. The more we know about God, the more we have to praise him about, the more we have to be grateful for, the more we have to be thankful for, the more we have to be amazed by. You ever seen, uh, oh gosh, what was the name of the movie? John Goodman was this uh, um, politician kind of guy, and Melanie Griffith played this dumb kind of bimbo type, excuse me for saying that, but it's true, um, that just kind of went along with him. And he took her to a party, and she made an absolute fool of herself in Washington, D.C. And so he hires a... um, he hires a, a lawyer to instruct her, to teach her, so that she doesn't look to be so foolish. And she was talking about how she really didn't need it and she didn't care and how she's got this mink coat. Look, I've got a mink coat. What else do I need? And he asked her the question, well, how do you know that a mink coat is valuable? And her response is, well, because I used to have a rabbit coat. She traded up. And then she knew the difference in the lesser thing because she had the greater thing. Why, why not stand amazed and camp around the, the anthill in your backyard? Why go up to the eagle caps? Because one is much more grand. One is much more glorious. Knowing who God is, knowing his word, not relegating truth to just the big areas that don't matter is to give us more reason to be, pra- uh, to be worshipful of God, to know him, to praise him, and to be excited, to put into our mind and to glorify him for And he goes on, verse 25. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. That same word again, uh, anamnason. Put it in your mind. As often as you drink this, put it in your mind that this is about me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim, the, 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 the this is a verb, but the root is the same root word that we get angel from. The same root word that we get angel from. An angel, the word angelos, literally means messenger or herald. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you herald, you proclaim, you announce the Lord's death until he comes. If you don't want to be caught in mindless uh, affection or compassion rather or in heartless intellectualism know the truth know the truth Paul's logic here it is let me let me just see if I can sum this up he says this Christ instructed me so I'm instructing you put it in your mind and proclaim it to the world it's not optional it's not negotiable truth honors the Lord's supper And truth honors the Lord's sacrifice. Truth honors the Lord's supper and truth honors the Lord's sacrifice. What are our next steps? Number one, I would say, take seriously the reading of God's word. Read it often and read it fast. Uh, Don't just, don't just look at God's word and say, well, I'm going to, I'm going to study, you know, one chapter for the next six months until I know it really, really well. That's an okay thing to do, and I would highly encourage you to study the word of God and to seek out what it means. But do both. Read it just for the sake of reading it. Mitchell Library, Multnomah University, where Jennifer and I went to Bible college, um, John Mitchell was the founder, and there's a big plaque right outside the door that says, don't you folks ever read your Bibles? 
He would say that to students all the time. The man had absorbed more scripture than I've never heard of anybody talk about somebody who, whose mind and heart was so filled with scripture as John's. And he didn't seek out to memorize large chunks of scripture. He just read it over and over and over six, ten times a year, just fast. It just read it over and over and over. Truth of the matter is this book is an inexhaustible source of truth. You will never grow tired of it. Study it but also read it fast. A couple of resources. I'm going to uh, blaze through these pretty quickly. If you're interested in them, you can ask me about them afterwards. If you're interested in a a start at uh, some systematic theology, I would recommend uh, Bible Doctrine by Wayne Grudem. Um, There's bigger ones from there, but that would be a good start. And if you wanted a good commentary that helps explain the text, uh, there's one by John Wolverd called the Bible Knowledge Commentary. It's two parts, Old Testament, New Testament. It's not overwhelming, but when you... When you get to difficult spots or you're having a hard time understanding, it would do a good. It would do good to uh, to help explain the text. Uh, men, we're starting. There's a, a group of us that started talking about this um, on Sunday mornings from six thirty to eight thirty. We're going to start meeting here. We're going to be going through uh, a bigger version of Wayne Grudem's systematic theology. We're not going to go very fast. We're shooting for maybe like three hundred pages a week, and. Um, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> no, we're, we aren't going to go very fast. We're, we're going to value depth over speed. We're going to take a look at scripture. We're going to pray together. We're going to read a, systemat- a portion of this systematic theology and, uh, and discuss it and really try and know some of the deep truths of what God has, has taught us. We're not going to value speed. We're going to value depth. I don't care if we read 10 pages and it takes us 10 weeks to exhaust it. Uh, I don't think it will, but... Um, um, you know, so I'm not asking for a huge commitment of, you know, reading a thousand pages every week, but I am asking for a commitment of meeting together to know God and to know his word. There's five of us so far that have committed to meet. And so men, if that's something you're interested in, let me know. I'll let you know what book to get and, uh, and we'll see you there. Another thing I would say is this wage war on busyness. I don't think the busyness of our culture and our world is accidental. I, I, think it's, I think it's part of Satan's attack on, on God's people. I, I met with a group of guys when I was at Multnomah and made a bunch of excuses as to why I wasn't reading my Bible. And John Bima looked at me and he said, you know, if the devil can't make you bad, he'll make you busy. Anything God can do to distract us from this, anything Satan can do to distract us from this, he knows is a distraction from God. Did God surely say, wage war on busyness, wage war on busyness in your homes, wage war on busyness in your lives. We need to wage war on busyness here. I am convinced that the thing that will influence your children for the kingdom more than anything else, that will influence their salvation more than, than anything else, will, see, will be seeing you engage in joyful worship of God Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. Sunday together and day by day by day at home. Do the math. You've got 18 years. 18 times 52. That's a lot of Sundays. If, you're, if going to church is a drudgery for you, if it's boring, if you have to be forced to go, if you go only so that your wife won't nag you anymore, what are you, what are you telling your kids? What are you telling them about God? God's boring. He's not worth it. He's not enjoyable. What if they never see you in this book for yourself to just find joy in God, to delight in him? What are you teaching them? You can't offer anything you don't have. And if you don't have joy in Christ, if you don't have a desire to be in the word, your kids won't either. If busyness is distracting you from being able to do those things, wage war. And the last one I think kind of goes with this one. Set time limits on technology. Set time limits on technology. It's really easy to turn on the TV instead of picking up your Bible. But I never walk away from from a TV feeling the same way as when I pick up my Bible. Dusty Bibles always lead to dirty lives.